Midterms in particular. Oh. Did I already turn them again? I thought we already turned them again. <coughs> I've reached, I'm passing them back. If you want them physically. If you're okay with the grade you got, and that might be predictive of the grade you will get, as the midterm is half of the final, if you feel comfortable, if you got 50 or over, you're probably chill. Just to explain, because somebody asked by email what extra credit meant, I just wanted the capability of having a spreadsheet, a straight spreadsheet that I could export and import from Moodle, but no, we had to get a learning management system with bells and whistles that all automatically does all kinds of fancy things, except wrong. <laughs> so, the midterm on the syllabus is 50 points. But you notice you got extra credit. There's an extra credit section because Moodle won't let me allow allow me to fill in any value above 50 points. So like there's 75, there's so 25 points automatically of extra credit built into the midterm, right? So, I don't know why I do that, just being nice, I guess. So where, like where I have my extra credit, it says F? It's not Ignore that. Okay. That's the machine basically calculating a piece based on the total grade, which it actually shouldn't. For example, if you got, you know, on the papers that were worth 30, you got full credit, you got full credit. Basically, you got full credit if you turned it in, right? Because I didn't bother to, you know, dock you for time because I don't have time to calculate when it was due versus when you turned it in, especially if that's individual. So. Assessment and diagnosis. Now, technically, we are at this level. You don't get to diag actually make diagnoses until uh, you're not only certified, but also licensed to be able to do that. But at our level, we have to know what all the, what the, the diagnosis means. And so often, uh, for example, in higher ed, I can do an ASAM-based assessment on students. Most of the time, I don't bother because if their level of use requires being referred out, I will refer them out because I know what the criteria are and I'll be sharing some of that with you. Uh, so, but if I bother to do the paper form, it's a pre-assessment because a real addictions assessment is done with the urinalysis. Higher education doesn't do urinalysis as an industry. So therefore it's a pre-assessment. So assessment is basically a judgment about something based on understanding a situation. Also we have criteria. Uh, the dictionary definition of that and diagnosis, identifying of an illness or disorder in a patient through an interview, physical exam, and medical tests and other procedures. So we don't do physical exams or medical tests that's separate from our health clinic, with, done with our health clinic, which doesn't do UAs. So therefore, you know, people come to me in various stages of intoxication, and if you're good, you can detect that, because it's obvious, you know, pupils, smell, they'll, they'll just tell you, because they're in crisis. Sometimes they can be in crisis without being under the influence of anything and still show certain symptoms. You have to be able to determine that. So assessment and understanding the situation. So you have to know not only what they are telling you, but the part of the story that they're not telling you, but inferred by the evidence in the story to the degree that it's evidence. Now, what I mean by that? My dad, still alive, but he said to me one time, son, dope fiends lie to you. Really, dad, they do. And it's not because they often out, out and out want to conceal the truth from you, but they're scared to tell the truth for various reasons, like you might report them if you're a mandatory reporter or some other thing. So you have to infer certain things based on experience. 
Now, usually when somebody tells me they have a few beers, my suspicious drug counselor mind says, you've been binge drinking. Because few technically means three, but when it's not just three, it could be a six pack or multiple six packs, like the guy today told me several. Uh, several what? Well, steel reserve. Define several, put a number on it. Seven. Okay, you drank 21 doses, nearly a case. Basically equivalent to a fifth of vodka. Oh, that explains why I got ripped off. Right, you passed out and you got rolled while you were passed out. Okay, real simple. Yeah, you were beyond the blackout. Actually, you were probably in the blackout after the second beer. But, oh, I didn't know that. So, part of the story is, huh, a few beers shouldn't incapacitate you unless the beers are really high test, right? So he's not gonna say I drank 21 doses. I'm the first person to tell them to break it down into doses that he's ever encountered. And that's fairly common. So that's why I'm training you on that. So you do that too. So that becomes fairly common. All right, so you wanna ask yourself, what's the story behind the story? that they're telling you. Because they're usually coming to you bringing a problem. Right? So what's the story behind the story? So, normal. So one of the things that you want to talk about in especially our society, like what's normal? So if you start just with alcohol and drugs, right? Experimental use is really literally the first or second time. After that, the experiment is over. Now, when a person started using, so what's normal for that? So the data actually gives us some inkling of normal, but I want to point out to you, and it's not just my paranoia, society has a whack idea of what normal is. Okay, so given that, we should use some kind of scientific medical definition of what normal is. So for example, the concept of gateway drugs, which we've talked about before. So gateway drugs. So the idea is you, you encounter alcohol and tobacco is usually your gateway drug, first gateway drugs. Alcohol, an external substance, it basically conditions you to the idea that an external substance changes your consciousness. Tobacco conditions the lungs for smoking. So many times, most people's first drug experiences are with alcohol and tobacco. And then marijuana, a smoked external substance, changes your consciousness, and it's usually the first four way into the underground illegal drug territory, which is, as I said before, when I mentioned this several weeks ago, it's not like heroin dealers sell pot to. But you have to cross a legal mental line to acquire marijuana. Which means socially acceptable. Right. Right? So you have to cross, you know, society as a whole necess doesn't necessarily condone the use of marijuana because it's still illegal at the federal level. All right? So it's usually your first foray into the underground illegal drug territory in terms of you know, uh, uh, swimming around in the underground economy ocean. So normal, so technically what we call the first use, the average age of initiation, the age of initiation, the first time, you, which is basically the first time you use on your own, not holidays, not football game, it's basically the first time you consciously use on your own, the age of initiation. So, the prevention data define the age of initiation as between 10 to 14 years old, back in the day. Now, the organ age of initiation had been 10 for quite some time, going on decades now, all right? So that's the normal 
first use, around 10. Okay, so you subtract five from that, that's basically like fifth grade. Okay, so yeah, especially if you're a parent, but you know, fear doesn't necessarily give you the skill to deal with it. So understand, when I first came here in 83, when I left LA, dealing went down to the first grade. Okay, so first use definitely was in kindergarten. And we're talking about kids, you know, dealing joints to each other for lunch money. My husband works for the railroad. Him and his buddies were working in Corona. Mm -hmm. And um, outside of Riverside. Yes. Yeah. And um, they were getting lunch at a Popeyes, and a ten-year-old pulled a gun on my husband and. Mm. co-worker mm -hmm. and proved my husband didn't know really what to do other than there's you know give him what he wanted because there's this 10 year old holding a gun in his face yeah you know and it's like how scary is that yeah i think it's more scary to have a child pointing a gun in your face than it is an adult sure the logical unawareness right you know so yes yeah, so and the child has nothing to lose legally because not at all yeah like those kids who just went to school, it was in the newspaper. These kids um, in elementary school, they were 10 years old, actually went to school with a plot to kill one of their classmates. And they're, um, it's like the city of Eugene has never prosecuted someone this young. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't know whether or not to try them as adults or kids. Oh, in Florida, they try them as adults if they were black. So I, I, just don't, I just don't see why it's such a hard concept to understand that education is so much more effective um, to the children socially and economically than rehabilitation yes. you know I think it's much my son is seven and I talk to him about everything from where babies come from to drugs it you know it's it's just you know I feel more comfortable my son hearing it from myself and his father than from peers, you know. I had two kids walking past, two boys walking past my house the other day. They were in junior high, I think, maybe freshmen. And they were talking, and one said, you know, I really didn't like the way you were touching my, my, my dick the other day. And he goes, man, that's how you do it. That's how you jack off. And I was standing outside unloading my groceries and I literally was like, excuse, like, yeah, right. you know, I kind of freaked out a little bit because my son was out there playing, you know, and there's little girls walking behind him and I was <coughs> girls, stay away from those boys, you know, and it just really freaks me out. Okay, yes. Yeah. So what you're talking about, well, I wrote this word on the board, habilitation. Habilitation comes from the Latin, there is a creature before us, homo habilis, that is handyman. So habilis did fire, habilis made tools, habilis made clothes. And uh, so yeah, about a million years ago, a million and a half years ago. Sorry for those of you who are in creationism, I'm into the science, so science says a million and a half years ago, mm -hmm. right? So this is where we get the word habilitation. So when you habilitate somebody, habilitation can almost be like socialization. Okay, habilitation means you know how to make tools, you know how to put on your clothes, you know basically civilized behavior what we used to call normal, right? And it was the parents that reinforced that in whatever parents, tribe, or whatever, an extended family situation or nuclear situation, right? There are cer certain things that we used to consider normal. Ten-year-olds with guns holding people up at Popeye's, that's not normal. Ten-year-olds talking about masturbation on the street, uh, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here we are where these kids are being socialized by forces other than what used to be called 
normal. Right? So, normal is, normal is change, right? So, and we have just, so you assume, so this definition of normal was assuming that society was norm for non-use and non-addiction without, assuming, without understanding what addiction is. Right? So this, these numbers used to be shocking. Used to be. But we've been living with these conditions for some time. Very long time. Yeah, at least a decade, if not two. Yeah. All right? So, generally speaking, remember this is part of assessment. So you want to know how long this use pattern has been going on and when it crossed the line into addiction from abuse. Right? So some of the patterns you want to look for if they started before 10, that's pretty much, that's, well, it's problematic, but it usually indicates the parents were using. Absolutely. And the parents were using, if the kids are using between 5 and 10. Okay, now we're assuming normal parental controls where at least the parents try and hide it from the kid. If not, try and hide it from the kid. Don't let the kid use till... X time. And sometimes the kid, you know, because the parents are using, will be av that will be aversive and the kid won't want to use until, well, their initiation age will be delayed because of that out of rebellion, out of oppositional. All right? So the idea about, okay, what's normal? Who decides what normal is? Society kind of generates those normal, those norms, if you will, but also, uh, people have an inherent sense of right and wrong. It's like intrinsic. It's like genetic. No matter what the parents are doing, the kid has a sense, this is right, this is wrong. You know, I love mom and daddy, but something is not right with them. All right, so if they start before 10. So this also indicates, of course, some types of abuse or neglect which be may, may be later self-medicated to relieve the abuse-related trauma. Two, they're not going to tell you this, okay? But you can pretty much infer it from what they're telling you, all right? So it's very common, as another example, just to add in, okay, so this is strictly substance abuse, but we also know that substance abuse is the symptom, not just the disease. It's often indicative of something else. And now if we throw in eating disorders and understanding that food can be a drug. Actually, I'm going to put something up on Moodle. It's a New York Times article because it's all the rage right now. It's a 20, it prints out at 21 pages. You want to look at it, basically it talks about how the food industry, like the major food players, basically said, oh, well, we know that there's obesity, we know that it's sugar, salt, and fat that's causing it, and we basically are not changing what we're doing at all. Oh, well, there's an obesity e epidemic, and kids are being you know, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at 10. Oh, well, sucks to be you. Pepsi, Nestle's, Right, craft, all those people, right. A billion dollars a day. Sure, yeah. All right, so the reason I brought up that, you know, yes, I would say, out myself and say type 2 diabetes is an eating disorder because instead of using drugs, I medicate myself with salted peanuts or almonds or whatever. But if somebody does have an eating disorder and they're female, that's often indicative of some kind of sexual or emotional abuse. They're not going to tell you that. Because it's enough of a trip just to admit the eating disorder. But suspect immediately that there's some kind of physical or emotional abuse. And they're using food as the drug. They may also be using drugs, too. Right? But again, they're not going to tell you about the abuse because it's easier to admit the eating disorder. Right? So the story behind the story. Right? 
So, if you're the first person to identify the quote-unquote normal behavior in the family of origin of abuse as abusive, don't be surprised at pushback. Well, my parents were good. Or, this is the way we grew up, this is the way, you know, we, we used to say this about poverty. We didn't, we were so poor, we didn't know we were poor. Hear people say that a lot. Well, okay, it wasn't your fault. And maybe you don't have the political analysis of, say, of Martin Luther King, who says poverty is violence. Poverty is violence because it's not accidental. It's actually <laughs> created by certain conditions. That's reinforced by society. So that's why he said, poverty is violence. That's an intentional neglect by society to have you not have the things you need. Intentionally. By design. That's what makes people like him dangerous. So I'm just saying, you tell somebody they came from an abusive background, they're not necessarily going to defend that. Because what can they say? They were kids when the abuse happened. They didn't know that it was abuse. Right? You might be the first person to make that clinical diagnosis. There's a, there's a fear aspect. Yeah. You know, a lot of these people are, in this, are still in the situation. I myself came from an abusive home. I spent time in women's shelters as a young teen. Um, and the fear that just comes from stepping out of that situation is you know, it can be pretty heavy. Yeah. Right. Okay, that all, which all fits into your assessment, too, as to what you indicate. So normal is what happens on a regular, predictable basis. Okay? So this has changed so much that we now keep referring to the new normal. So normal used to be considered being raised by a two-parent nuclear family. And those values were reinforced throughout the media and, you know, what we called normal. So, now, with more people being raised by the system, system's not a very good parent, though marginally better than abusive parents, but sometimes worse than abusive parents. And because it's the system, it's normalized, right? How do you intervene with DHS? Hmm. Not our call, we're just basically dealing with the people in front of us. So, you have people who weren't parented raising kids the way the cat learned to swim. Now, all cats actually do know how to swim, instinctively. But some cats like to swim, and they're top predators, like jaguars, tigers, panthers. They intentionally my cat, swim. My cat is six months old, and she's a little black and white cat, and she is in the bathtub whenever my daughter's in that bathtub. And she will just sit there and purr. Okay. Yep, she's weird. Okay. It's not that they are afraid of water. It's, they can. They just don't like it sometimes. So, have I shown you this? Emotional equations? No. Huh? I don't think so. I haven't seen it. All right. So, this is a suicide equation. Anger denied expression multiplied becomes depression. A minus E in parentheses equals depression. So, the anger at being abused and denied the ability to protest, report, or be protected from my abuser and the number of times I, can, I was abused that I can remember if I actually try to count them, but I can't or don't want to, Remember, so let's say at least 50 times that I can remember. Now, this is an equation for a suicidal person who was 16 at the time that I encountered her. And wouldn't essentially admit to being physically or sexually abused, but definitely was emotionally abused. The means being extreme religiosity. And I'm sorry, what did the E stand for again? Expression. <clears throat> Anger denied expression multiplied by some number equals depression. 
So this is basically saying that some forms of depression are actually sublimated anger. But if the person being abused, because that's the natural, normal reaction for being injured if somebody's injuring you. You're mad at them. But if they're more powerful than you, perceived or actual, you can express that anger. So you stuff it. You internalize it. And then you'll do behavior that you self... This is where a lot of self-injury comes from. This is where you get your cutters. This is where you get, you know, suicide attempts by various means. Again, so this is another thing. They're not necessarily going to tell you this unless you ask them direct. Okay, something's driving the suicidal behavior if it's a pattern for them. Something's driving the cutting and not just the endorphin reaction from cutting. Okay, there's something else. So that's what I'm saying in terms of your assessment. The story behind the story, what they ain't saying, but is indicated by some of their behavior. Okay, and they're waiting for you to name the behavior. So don't be scared to ask. And don't necessarily assume that the no is actually, it didn't happen. Right? So, A minus E, 50 times D. Anger denied expression, multiply 50 times that I can remember becomes depression. Now, I actually sat down with her and basically, the 50 times that we're talking about was like daily abuse that had happened that term. And she said, I, this has been going on for as long as I can remember. But particularly when I became a teenager and puberty and I didn't have the sex talk from mom. Mom barely even told me how to use tampons with my period or whatever. Just pray. That's effective. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. So she became angry. Angry enough so she couldn't express it. Praying wasn't working for her, so she cut it herself. One time, and this is why I brought up the cat thing, as a mandatory reporter, and she comes in with this wound on her wrist, and I'm going, how did you miss an artery? Because this is like, so, you know, I had to call the parents, call the principal, et cetera, et cetera. They took her home, and they believed, she was mad at me for about three months, but they believed, she said it was a cat scratch. So I got a lion claw necklace. That claw is like this. If that was a cat scratch, then the cat was a lion. Not that much of a gap. <laughs> Like I said, that's wide and is deep enough. How she miss an artery and how she didn't lose any tendons or whatever is amazing. But she came back eventually and basically said, look, I can't handle this anymore. I've got to talk about this. So, okay. So depression is painful. <clears throat> D equals P. Pain must be relieved. In this case, relief was multiple suicide attempts and self-medication to the point of blackout. And this is also... Not just getting loaded, but attempted suicide by blackout by using alcohol and pills. Two. Intentional overdose. Which people may or may not admit that they're doing. So part of the, the in terms of assessment, look, I'm not trying to be heavy here, I'm just saying this is real. It comes up with enough frequency that you should ask for it and ask them about it, right? So, to solve that equation, you have to uh, express the anger. So, anger plus expression multiplied at least by as many times that you can remember equals more health. Now, the challenge with expressing this, and this is one of the, in my practice <laughs> here, this is why I ask people, what is your art? And they look at me like I'm crazy. What is your art? 
Do you write? Do you draw? Do you daydream? What, you know, do you play music? You have to have a way of expressing the anger in a way that's safe for you to do that. Be able to write your story as if it happened to somebody else and suggest an alternate ending. That's one. But basically, you can basically have them write you know, the story of what happened to them because at least they can admit it to themselves if not you. Assuming you're working in an agency where you can do that, and if you're working with a kid, yeah, if they're living in an abusive household, it might not be safe for them to keep a diary. And you have to also consider your own agency policies, etc., around that kind of stuff. So part of the reason I bring this up in a community college setting is because people will tell an English and writing teacher stuff that they won't tell their pastor, their parent, or even the drug counselor. So I'm constantly getting, you know, well, what do I do with this? I go, yeah, right, right. They're disclosing this to you, and you're not trained to deal with it. Get it a lot in my coping and uh, stress and depression class coming up next term. People write horrific stories. It, you know, so I'm not certain whether normal has become this toxic or there are just a lot of people in pain. I think it's become that toxic. <laughs> but, you know, I'm in an occupation where I would see more of that and more concentrated. So that, again, means that you have to, when you're hearing a story like this, you know, I'm not creating this stuff to be glib. You want a real way out because this is what's coming to us. All right, so the diagnosis. So if you remember what I said on the board a few weeks ago, di means to, gnosis means to know, knowledge of spiritual truths reputedly possessed by the ancient Gnostics who believed them to be essential to salvation. So what I mean by diagnosis that is knowledge by the two parties involved in the healing transaction. What is necessary for it to occur? Not just by one person, the professional. So usually in a diagnostic relationship, it's the diagnoser and the client-patient you know, who gives you the label of, oh, you're bipolar, oh, you have opposition, you know, borderline personality disorder, oh, you have this, that, and the other, right? So even if, so the person has a, a collection of symptoms or a constellation of symptoms uh, by which, which generates the diagnosis, but they may or may not have um, necessarily the way out. Because is the way to heal trauma Prozac? Well, you know what I think about that already. So let's give them some skill about understanding what happened to them. So diagnosis. I'm not qualified to diagnose, no. But you are required to know what it means and to be able to explain to the client what it means so the client can make cognitive, that is thinking, emotional or affective, and behavioral changes in light of the diagnosis. So cognitive changes, emotional changes, and behavioral changes. Cognitive in the way you think, because thinking does generate behavior and it does go along with certain emotions emotional changes so that, okay, you need to notice what you're feeling about this. And behavioral changes. How do you handle your grief? How do you handle your rejection? In the light of the diagnosis. So, yeah, you can give a label to the condition, but labeling doesn't give you the way out especially if the way out is a skill set. I mean, this is one of the problems, just to, I'm not suggesting you take the class or whatever, I'm just saying it's an example of one of the things that we find in the field. Um, so in the coping skills with stress and depression class, one of the, pro one of the problems that I encounter is that the most popular book, because... This is higher education, right? Got to have a textbook. Can't just teach from your experience. You could, but people feel more comfortable with a textbook. 
right? Unless you write it. Right? You can't necessarily put in everything. So in, this is, we're using as a textbook the most popular book on stress, coping skills with stress and depression. And students uniformly find it lame. I find it lame because it's addressing a level of stress and depression that they're not experiencing. It's as if the book is written for a salt and pepper reality and their lives are habanero. I like culinary metaphors, right? Their lives are intense. And how are they supposed to, if they try and apply their level of intensity to the book, it's not matching. I'm saying, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Because my predecessor relapsed. And my predecessor was, you know, they described him as a fair-haired golden boy, so a white dude, working a five-year 12-step program. He's clean and sober five years and, you know, from script opiates. This place drove him to relapse. Now, there are other people that the same circumstances wouldn't necessarily drive them to relapse, but I completely understood why he would relapse, being here within the first six months. What kept me clean and sober, no, not at least driven to drink or use or whatever, is I'm a black man operating a predominantly white organization in a predominantly white state. I know how to survive this. This is easy. I'm not crazy. They are. Not everybody. I mean, just the people that are addictive. People calling me up saying, oh, well, Fred came drunk. Should he drive a golf cart? You're seriously asking that? No. Can't we have an abstinence policy during work hours for everybody, just like in K-12? Uh, no, we have a culinary program. Well, so what? They serve alcohol. Uh, can't we have a no-use policy during work hours? Well, uh, you know, I, 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 why are we even having this conversation? Oh, I could see why he went crazy. So I basically have to keep my act tighter than y'all are keeping it. Because, look, students want faculty who are clean and sober at least in front of the classroom, right? I mean, and I'm trying to explain to my faculty, fellow faculty, yeah, you're too drunk to drive a car. You shouldn't be in front of a classroom. And they're saying, well, Mark, we don't want anybody running afoul of your policy just because they have a carafe of wine at Mozzie's and they're slurring their words. Wow, this is like normal to you guys? You go to lunch, have a carafe of wine by yourself.